Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Will. Great to have you here, man. Good morning, and screw the last day. You all are here, and this is the first day of your entrepreneurial journey, and this is the first day for us, you and me, to talk about the future of mobility. I am insisting that you leave inspired, but I guess that's my job right now to make sure that that happens. So we'll kick it off. Um, I'm going to talk about some pretty techy wonky stuff, um, but we're going to go on a journey today. And that journey is about shaping the mobility revolution that's all around us. Every one of you arrived in some form of vehicle. I know that because most people don't walk from their hometowns to San Francisco today, even if your hometown is San Francisco. Uber, Lyft, BART, cab, if you still know what that is, and then your own personally driven vehicle. These are the ways we get along. And what's interesting is that most of us just don't think about how that hardware gets made. And it's actually the way that that hardware gets made that defines whether it's safe and defines whether it's what you want in order to be able to use it. So we're going to talk about that. In the last decade, all of the top line products have been disrupted by digital. You recognize, most of you recognize, hopefully some of you don't even recognize the ones at the top, and then the ones at the bottom you definitely know. And there's a digital thread that runs through those products that we just assume is now something that we understand. And that makes sense to us. But these products, they're different. They haven't been disrupted by digital. These products, vehicles, consumer-driven vehicles and military vehicles, they kill five and a half people a week in the United States due to distracted driving. And for all of you that have a phone up right now that are taking a picture, it's that phone that causes most of what used to be called drunk driving. But we don't question it. That's the same number of people that got killed in the Boeing 737 first crash that happened. And then by the second one, what did we do? We grounded the whole fleet. But we don't ground our consumer cars today for killing the same number of people every week. Why? Why? We need to change that. And so for us, that record starts with powering a new form of manufacturing. Thank you, Henry Ford, for giving us, and Frederick Taylor, and Sakichi Toyota, and all of these lions of manufacturing. Thank you for giving us what we have today, but the end result of that is what Tesla is. Big factory, lots of money, and big risk to be able to put out a vehicle. But it doesn't keep pace with technology. So the problem right now is that we have old business models trying to apply technology that moves at the speed of software. And so we need to get that technology, sensors, batteries, drives, fabrics, IoT, everything that you've heard about and think is whiz-bang, but doesn't show up in the Lincoln Navigator that you drive in. We need to think about how to evolve that. And for us, the way that solution came about is, one, get efficient. Efficient in the way you apply capital, reduce the billion-dollar cost of putting out a vehicle to zero. That was our irrational assumption when we started. No tooling cost. Make it a digital file, hit a button, vehicle pops out. Sounds unreasonable, but you're going to see how it happens today. Integrate, integrate, integrate. Integrate with regulators. Integrate with tech providers. Integrate with service providers. Steve Case wrote a book about it that was aping Alvin Toffler. How many of you have read Steve Case's latest book when it comes to the subject of the future of work or Industry 4.0? Anyone? Hands? A few. OK, so um, learning about how these new Industry 4.0 businesses actually come uh, to the forefront is what lets you know how to do agile hardware and collaboration. You can't be, a, you can't be just 30 uh, um, programmers in a room, launch a product over the wire, and say you've built a company. These are things that carry people, children, adults, other things like that, and they need to integrate, and they need to collaborate. But if you do it all, you can have a first mover advantage, and you can launch vehicles and launch the next vehicle. And that's what we're talking about. So a digital OEM, to us, connects our three major elements by a digital thread. A global community of people. Talk about a community, what that means. Direct digital manufacturing that's protected as an idea. It's chemical engineering. It's computer science. It's the, I can hit a button, and a new mobility solution pops out the other side. If you were here on the first day and you heard about that moment when Brad Templeton walked in, when I think Rob Nail was talking about it with uh, you know, a self-driving car, or it might have been David Roberts, and basically the bottom line was everybody unloaded from the Singularity University classroom to see 
what is a self-driving car? That's what you feel like when you see a vehicle being digitally manufactured. It's an amazing moment. And then micro factories. Put these things all over the world at low capital cost so you can recycle locally, upgrade locally, instead of shipping vehicles from Detroit. That's what makes you a digital OEM. If you're an economist, um, I'm not even going to try for that one, but if you're an economist, this is the story that's going on under the covers. So I'll walk over here to the screen so that you can see. Typically, the cost curve goes from the top left to the bottom right. Tons of money up front, and you hope to make 20,000 vehicles a year at a minimum, maybe 300,000 vehicles a year. But that assumes that consumers want to buy what you're selling. The ability to be able to not go all the way back up the cost curve, but to go a little bit back up the cost curve is what we do. So there's no smoke and mirrors here. Our development of the vehicle is cheap, but our individual piece part cost is a little more expensive. This is illustrative, it's not to scale. But what it means is that we can make vehicles at 1,000 units, and now we figured out how to do it at 200 units profitably. So the price we charge for our vehicles allows us to make money and introduce technology way sooner. This is the microeconomic angle for what we've discovered in digital manufacturing. And so here's a mantra that I love. Ignore the world when you make your product, and the world is going to ignore your product. But if you make what they ask for, they're going to pay you in loyalty. Motorola had a StarTac. Does anyone remember those? 175 bucks, 2006, it was the best cell phone on the market. And they made an 8% EBITDA margin. Apple came in in 2007 and said, we're going to charge $700 for a phone, totally irrational, and they have sustained a 34% EBITDA margin. That's possible because you're delivering against a need, a want, a desire for people to have more than what the StarTac offered. Vehicles need to do that. So there's some whys. Having a digital manufacturer for the user means you get customization, you get choice, you get freedom. But for the company, the business, you also get to do some interesting things. You get to think about people, planet, and profit. When people ask me about sustainability in vehicles, they're always thinking about tailpipe emissions. But that is a low target for a vehicle. Electric vehicles have solved that problem. And so there are many things in sustainability that go beyond that. Local living economies, the disruption that happens in jobs and big manufacturing, factory intensity, paint shops, other things like that, non-recyclability of vehicles, the future of battery recyclability. This is about our planet that we live on. And when I was born, there were half the number of people in the world that there are today. Think about that exponential growth. And so therefore, shared mobility is axiomatic. We have to have it. We need to be more shared in the way we think about moving around. And businesses that can deliver that can change the planet. So that's the impact. So this is how we do it. We built a global community. It now has 200,000 people in it that help us design our vehicles. That global community believes in our brand, that if you can tell us what you want, we're going to print it, make it, and deliver it all over the world. And then we built our network of micro factories, which is growing. We have two, and we're about to launch a third. So Knoxville, Tennessee, and Phoenix, Arizona are our first two factories. And upcoming, in September, we're going to announce our new European micro factory location. And we're going to start growing in Asia and a number of other places around the world to bring this. And so it is underpinned by this subject. Agile hardware for us is what it's about. Now, Agile Software started 25 or 30 years ago, and there was a manifesto that we have carefully crafted in order to be able to look at what that future is. And this is really where you can help us evangelize what it is that we've done. The values. I don't love lists, but this list is a really, these two slides are very important for us. The values are about changing the way, the white is where we used to be. And so when you think about creativity, and people and communities, and client dialogue, and the world of a minimum viable product, this is what Agile hardware needs to be. The last one is one that I want to focus on here, which is responsibly iterating to get to greater safety. So we heard from David Roberts that the moment that a first toy flew up to the ceiling, that you saw the joy in a child's face, and that begot what we have at Gatwick Airport today, the single greatest transportation revolution born on a set of principles that was about joy.